Hello everyone and welcome back. I am Miguel Alfonso Mendez from the Von Karman Institute for Fluid Dynamics and this is the third video in the series of tutorial on modern analysis using our software package Modulo. In the first video I gave you a general overview of modern analysis and its mathematical framework. The second video was dedicated to the DFT and the POD. This third video lecture is dedicated to multi-scale proper orthogonal decomposition, the MPOD, which is the main decomposition implemented in our software. With this video we close our review of the theoretical background and from the next video David and Nini will continue with practical tutorial sessions on the software. This lecture is structured in four parts. In the first we will review the fundamentals of multi-resolution analysis, MRA. In the second, we will then analyze what happens when you compute the POD of filtered data. And in the third, we will combine what we have learned in the first two and we will introduce the MPOD algorithm. Finally, we will take back the two exercises that we have seen in the previous video that have severely challenged the DFT and the POD and we will see how the MPOD can naturally handle this. So, what is MRA? I will first motivate it with uh, an example. Consider a signal which has multiple scales. We sum together three sinusoids and we add some random noise with the Gaussian PDF with zero mean and zero two standard deviation. One sinusoid has a frequency of one hertz and an amplitude of one and exists in the entire domain. The other two have higher frequencies, say 90 Hz and 20 Hz, and most importantly they are modulated by two Gaussians that are centered in different time intervals. The first one is centered at 1 second and the second at 2.2 seconds. So you can see that the first term exists only within uh, this first time window, while the second exists only within uh, this time window. When we do frequency analysis of the signal, that is when we do Fourier decomposition, we build a spectrum that looks like this. Here we have uh, frequencies and here we have uh, amplitudes. So we can easily see that we have a peak at 1 Hz, at 20 and 90 Hz. But we have no information on when these are located in time. So in this exercise I, I ask you to identify these three contributions in the time and the frequency domain and to do that you should start your journey into multi-resolution analysis that is MRA. Now multi-resolution analysis is a very large topic and it is tightly linked to wavelet theory. I will not have the time to cover much in this video so here I recommend some excellent books if you want to know more. There are literally hundreds of books on the subject, these are just my favorite three. The first one is the Wavelet Tour on Signal Processing by Stefan Malat, one of the fathers of discrete wavelet analysis. The second uh, book is uh, Wavelets and Filter Banks by Gilbert Strang and Truong Guyen. And the third is the Friendly Guide to Wavelets by Gerald Kaiser. Now, the starting point to understand multi-resolution analysis is the theory of digital filters. This can be classified broadly into finite impulse response, that is FIR, or infinite impulse response, that is IIR. Each of these has its design methods. I can provide you more material uh, on filters if you want, but for this video I will skip the details on how to construct filters and I will focus on how to use them for MRA. Now, depending on their transfer functions, filters can be classified into three kinds. Low pass filters, band pass filters and high pass filters. Here I show you the modulus of their frequency transfer function versus the discrete frequencies on which they act. The frequency interval in which this modulus is unitary or approximately unitary is called pass band and the remaining is the stop band. When we apply a filter, frequencies in the pass band are multiplied by 1, so are left untouched, and frequencies in the stop band are multiplied by 0, so are cancelled. We denote the transfer function of a low pass filter as a function of the frequency and one free parameter, which is the cutoff frequency above which everything is removed. We can do the same for the high pass filter, in this case, everything below the FC be removed. In the bandpass we need two parameters to identify the region uh, 
between the frequencies that, that will be that will be preserved after the filtering. In what follows, we will use filters in the frequency domain. Therefore, uh, I will denote with capital U the Fourier transform of the signal. And when we apply a filter, we simply multiply this transform by the transfer function. And then we can invert the Fourier transform to get back into the time domain. So if uh, we do this for the low pass filter, the resulting signal will only have the low frequency part of the original signal. And similarly, we can do it for the band pass or the high pass. Now, the first ingredient of multi-resolution analysis is to construct a set of complementary filters that we mount in the so-called filter bank. In our bank, we want that all the transfer function used in the analysis adds up to one. This is equivalent to say that by adding all the different portions that we have identified, we get back our uh, original signal. So we have a lossless decomposition. And to make sure that our analysis is really lossless, we usually construct the entire bank starting from a template using uh, usually a low pass filter. So using this template, for example, uh, an high pass filter is uh, computed as one minus the low pass filter, while band pass regions are computed as differences between two low pass filters. In case you're wondering about this, the idea of having a reference template from which we can construct every filter in the bank is linked to the notions of modern wavelet and modern scales in wavelet analysis. Now, in this case, I have considered only three scales, as we say, but uh, these notions can be generalized to an arbitrary number of scales. So let's say we take M scale. So our signal now becomes the sum of various terms each of which retains a non-overlapping portion of the spectra of the original signal. Each scale is obtained by filtering the signal with a filter with transfer function HM. The set of transfer function is such that their band pass is 1 uh, within a certain region and 0 elsewhere, and they are such that they all sum up to 1. So essentially we have a low pass filter, a high pass filter, and M minus 2 band pass filters in the middle. And these are all complementary. The widths of these bands need not to be equal, and you can choose the partitioning of the spectra freely. This partitioning will be later introduced in our software in terms of a frequency splitting vector FV, which contains all the cutoff frequencies of the filters from F1 to Fm-1. So let's now take back our previous exercise. In the modular repository, you will find a function to perform multi-resolution analysis of a signal. So in this exercise, we can take, for example, a partition into five scales. For this, we introduce a splitting vector of four entries, let's say 10, 70, 110, and 300. These are Hertz. So the first scale is identified by a low pass filter that takes from 0 to 10 Hertz. The second scale comes from the band pass filter between 10 and 70, and then we have another one between 70 and 110, between 110 and 300, and finally the highest one from 300 to the Nyquist frequency. Of course, here three scales were a natural choice since you have three dominant frequencies and there's nothing interesting going on in the scale 4 and scale 5. If we look at the first four scales, here I'm showing you the result we see that basically we can identify the three contribution that we have introduced. The first is the low frequency present in the whole time domain, and these are the two modulated higher frequencies existing only within a certain time domain. So in this formulation, we can have both time localization, because we know when these two frequencies are present, and frequency localization. Of course, these two advantages must come with uh, a compromise. That is what the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle tells us. By improving time localization, we get worse frequency localization and vice versa. The definition of the scales is what let us play with this compromise. We can push this formulation to the limit in which we have many, many scales, for example. At the point in which we have only one frequency per scale, this becomes a Fourier decomposition and we have no more 
time localization. The other extreme is much less interesting. If we have only one scale, then that is exactly our signal in the time domain. We can now move to the second part. That is, what happens when we compute the POD of filtered data. We take back our uh, snapshot matrix uh, D. You remember from the previous video that every column is a snapshot at a specific time and every row has the time evolution of the data at a specific location. From the last video, you know that we can take the Fourier transform of the data by multiplying this matrix by the conjugate of the Fourier matrix Psi F, which I recall here. The Fourier matrix is a van der Mond matrix with the entries lying in the unitary circle of the complex plane. We also saw this in the previous video. If we take a square Fourier matrix, that is if we have an equal number of digital frequencies and snapshots, then computing the Fourier transform and its inverse is very easy. A multiplication by Psi F gives us the uh, inverse transform and a multiplication by the conjugate of Psi F gives us the transform. So if here we have in every row the temporal evolution of the data at a certain location, here we have in every row the Fourier transform of that corresponding temporal evolution. So let's see what happens when we filter our data. Let's say that the spectro at a certain location is this one. Our data is real, so the spectrum is symmetric. Now let's assume that we have a low-pass filter that takes only this portion of the spectrum, the one in the red area. And to isolate this, we use uh, a sure product. That is an entry-by-entry -entry multiplication between our transformed matrix and the transfer function of the filter. This is basically the filtering in the frequency domain that we have seen before. We assume now that our filter treats all the spatial location equally. So we are here constructing a matrix that is simply a copy of all the transfer function plays in all the rows. In this way, we are sure that we apply the same filter to all the rows. Here, the colored region is the band pass and the gray region is the band stop of the filter. So what is our low pass filter data? Well, first we move into the frequency domain by multiplication uh, of our matrix D by the conjugate of the Fourier matrix. Then we apply our filter by a simple multiplication with the transfer function and this is the spectra of our low pass filter data. Finally, we multiply by the Fourier matrix to come back into the time domain and here it is the low pass filtered uh, form of our original matrix. So let's see now what happens to the POD of this filtered data. To do that, we introduce the definition of a filtered matrix into the definition of the temporal correlation matrix. You remember from the previous video that this is computed as D DAG D, where DAG is the Hermitian transpose. Here in particular, we are interested in the correlation of the filtered data, of the low pass filtered data. If we introduce this expression here and we arrange and manipulate a bit these, uh, these terms, uh, using the distributive property of the Schur product, we highlight two important parts. The first term, which I denote as uh, Kf, is the uh, cross-spectral density matrix. That is the same as the temporal correlation matrix, but it is done in the frequency domain. The second is, well, just, just the short product between two rectangles and that gives a sort of box in the frequency domain. Only the frequencies inside this box remain and those outside are removed. Now the interesting point is that uh, this uh, cross-spectral density matrix can be obtained from uh, the temporal correlation matrix via a similarity transform. So this shares the same eigenvalues as K. Therefore, you could compute the POD also from this matrix. That is what happens in the spectral formulation of the POD. You will see then that the eigenvectors of this matrix are the Fourier transform of the eigenvectors of K. So this tells us about the frequency content of the POD modes. Now, this matrix KF is also symmetric and positive definite, and so it has uh, orthogonal 
uh, eigenvectors. So we can write uh, Kf uh, by expanding it in terms of outer products of its eigenvectors. And if we do that, we will see something really interesting. In particular, this box is going to kill many terms uh, out of this Kf. And particularly interesting are the ones along the diagonal. Why? Because along the diagonals you have the summation of positive quantities. This would be the uh, duct of uh, each eigenvector times the transpose of the same eigenvector. And so if the summation is zero, then it means that all the terms in the summation must be zero. But this tells us also about the frequency content of the POD modes. So basically we are saying that if we remove uh, using our filter uh, some frequencies from the data, then these frequencies cannot be present in any of the POD uh, structures. So this now brings us to the MPOD algorithm. Let's say that in addition to our previous low pass filter, we now consider also an intermediate range and an high frequency range. More generally, let's say that we do multi-resolution analysis of the data, as I have shown you in the first part of the lecture. So in this specific case, we are doing a multi-resolution analysis using only three scales. And you remember from the first part of the video that uh, the rules of the game is that uh, the sum of the three transfer function brings back to one so that we have a lossless decomposition and we also have no overlapping between different terms. So we can say that these scales are uh, orthogonal in the frequency domain. Now introduce this decomposition in the definition of the correlation matrix you can uh, easily see that you end up with two kinds of term. The first kind is the one that I call the pure terms. These are obtained from the inner products of uh, um, low with low, medium with medium, and high with high parts of the transfer function. And if you follow these products graphically, you will see that they form a, a set of boxes like, like this one in the figure. The second kind of terms are the mixed ones. For three scales, we have six of this, low with medium, low with high, uh, medium with high, etc, etc. And they basically cover the remaining part of our correlation spectra. Now, remember what we said about the filtering of the data. That was related to pure terms. We know that eigenvectors that have frequency content, let's say in this pure term, in the medium range, can have no frequency content in the low part or the high part. We cannot say the same about the mixed terms because high frequency and low frequencies can be mixed taken either from the rows or from the columns. So we can now see also how the multiscale POD links POD and DFT. If we have uh, only one scale, like in this case, then the MPOD is a POD. In this case, the, the composition can take uh, eigenvectors with all the frequencies it needs to satisfy the optimality constraint. When we have two scales, then a mode that has a frequency content in this area cannot have also frequency content in this area. So we start losing some information about the correlation matrix. We can increase the number of scales arbitrarily at the point in which every scale has one frequency, that is an MPOD with NT scales. In this case, we have the DFT. Interesting, in the first case, the reconstruction of uh, K is perfect, while in this case, the reconstruction of K is the one that gives the highest uh, loss of information in the correlation domain. So, interesting, the DFT is a POD in which the different frequencies or scales are not allowed to communicate. So, here is the MPOD algorithm currently implemented in Modulo, and that is the one presented in this article, where, by the way, if you are interested, you can find all the uh, theoretical derivation and background of this decomposition. Previous formulations were based on a combination between POD and wavelet decompositions, and here uh, was, uh, let's say, the first time we introduced the more general uh, multi-resolution framework of the method. 
Now, in the algorithm, the first step, as in the POD, is to compute the uh, temporal correlation matrix. The second step uh, consists in preparing our filter bank and filter the matrix in order to obtain the M contribution, or the contribution of each scale. Now, in order to follow the theoretical derivation, we diagonalize each of these contributions independently. Then we assemble the basis uh, from each of these uh, scales into one single basis. And we use a, a permutation matrix to put all the eigenvectors in order of energy contributions. Now, if uh, we have used uh, ideal filters and so if we can guarantee that there will be no spectral overlapping between uh, these terms then this is already your MPOD basis. In reality when we do the multi-resolution analysis we use filters that have a certain transition band and so there will be always uh, a slight uh, overlapping between the scales. So in the last step we add an optional uh, uh, QR factorization to ensure that the basis will always remain orthogonal. Typically this factorization does not do much in the sense that uh, uh, the novel, the final basis is very close to, to the one previously obtained, but this depends on how well you have uh, carried out your filtering. And finally, the last step is the same one as uh, in all the decomposition. So starting from the data matrix and uh, the temporal basis, which in this case is always orthogonal by construction, orthonormal in fact, then you can compute this partial structure as it was done for the POD and the DFT in the previous video. Now, at the moment, we are working on different variants of this algorithm to increase its computational efficiency. One of the main ideas for the fast MPOD is to avoid the diagonalization of uh, all the scales independently and instead do one uh, diagonalization of an appropriately filtered correlation matrix. This idea was triggered by Bo Watts, uh, who's a development uh, engineer at Dantec Dynamics, and uh, we are now all currently working on this uh, new development. We will soon release a uh, technical note to explain uh, the final version of the algorithm, uh, but for the moment a first beta version is uh, already available in Modulo. In this beta version, the key step is to assemble uh, a single approximated correlation matrix by summing all the contribution and then obtain the MPD basis by diagonalizing uh, all of this. The reason why this is still under development is that it is not easy to avoid frequency overlapping between various scales unless we use a very sharp filter in the frequency domain with the risk of creating spurious ringing. So, for the moment you have the possibility to use the beta version, but I just want you to be aware that this is under construction. So we can now move to the last part of this lecture dedicated to exercises. And among the five exercises available in the repository, I here take the two that were shown in the previous video. These are exercise one and exercise four. The first is about a 1D case and the exercise four is about um, a 2D vector field from time resolved particle image velocimetry. Um, you remember from uh, the previous video that uh, in the first exercise we uh, analyzed the velocity profile of a pulsating uh, 2D Poiseuille flow, which is sustained by two kinds of pulsations. One in red that has a, a low frequency and uh, another in black that has a high frequency. This high frequency starts at a certain time, grows and then vanishes before the end of the, uh, of the observation time. If you do not remember this case, please have a look at the previous video. You will see uh, or you maybe remember that when we do the POD of this test case, we have only two modes and these two modes are very confusing. In particular here I'm showing you the spatial structures of the first two modes, their associated temporal structures and the frequency content of these temporal structures. And here because of the energy optimality of the POD, we uh, get two modes that are a combination of uh, what is actually introduced uh, in the 
in the in the data so we have uh, both frequencies in the in both modes and we cannot distinguish uh, whether this uh, structure is linked to the low frequency or the or the high one now if we look at the cross spectral density matrix or which is the same uh, the flipped version of uh, uh, of the 2D Fourier transform of the correlation matrix, we clearly observe different peaks. Uh, this is the uh, contour of the absolute uh, value of this of this matrix, and here I'm showing you the uh, diagonal entry of this matrix, only in the positive parts being symmetric, uh, and you can see clearly that you have two dominant peaks which are of course linked to the two sources of pulsation that we have in the data so in this case we can take uh, let's say a tree scale decomposition here i'm showing you uh, the absolute value of the frequency response of the three filters that are designed uh, at the scope and you will see of course that in the third there is nothing interesting uh, going on here and when we look at the uh, spectra of the correlation matrices that are produced by the three scales, we can of course separate the effects of the low frequency content, the high frequency content, and the rest, which in this particular case is nothing. And if we look at the um, amplitudes of the MPOD basis that results from this factorization, from this multi-resolution analysis, we uh, observe that we have also only two modes this is particularly interesting because even if we have constrained the frequency content uh, of the pod we have the same number of modes uh, the same number of non-zero modes as in the pod of course this is not a general result it is true for this case and usually for cases that have uh, of that are almost rank deficient and that have a low uh, amount of, uh, of noise but uh, it is nevertheless interesting to see that uh, in comparison the DFT needs uh, about 80 modes and that is the limit at which the MPOD uh, will tend if we increase the number of, uh, of scales. Now if we look at the uh, two uh, modes identified by the MPOD we can see that uh, we have resolved, we have solved the, the spectral mixing problem that we have seen before. So we have one mode linked to the large scale pulsation and another mode linked to the faster uh, pulsation. We can localize them in time. So we have both frequency and spectral localization thanks to the uh, multi-resolution architecture and uh, accordingly we can see also in spatial structure the distinctive features of uh, of these two modes that we have commented in the in the previous video uh, in particular uh, in the first mode we we have an almost parabolic velocity profile because we have a quasi steady a low frequency pulsation while here we have a flattening of the of the velocity profile uh, due to the fact that uh, higher frequencies excite um, other modes uh, in the eigenfunction expansion that are responsible for the uh, increased uh, diffusion of momentum in the center of the channel. Finally we move to the exercise number four Again, if you do not remember uh, what this exercise is about, please go and check the, the previous video. Briefly, this is the time of PAV uh, measurement of an impinging jet, uh, which even if it is in stationary condition leads to a multi-scale problem, because in different points of the domain we have different frequencies that are dominating the, the flow. So as before, if we now look at the contour of the cross spectral density matrix we see um, this time uh, of course less pronounced peaks but still you can see that there are phenomena occurring at a higher frequency and others at a low frequency we will see that these are mostly linked to the to the turbulent structures in the jet and these are mostly linked to the structures in the wall jet 
and as before we can partition the spectra in uh, in different scales and this uh, as before will lead to uh, different parts uh, isolating uh, the various contributions and so if we look uh, at the structures that we have seen from the previous video here i replot them uh, using a queer plot we see again from the pod uh, problems of the spectral mixing so for example if i look at this mode this is uh, pod mode number four we have uh, both a large frequency content here which uh, presumably is mostly coming from the from the wall jet area here but you have also a bit of higher frequency content uh, with the strong number between 0 1 and 0 2 which is producing a bit of uh, i mean is uh, is capturing a bit of vortices in the jet but nevertheless these uh, structures and these structures come from completely different scales and and should not be in the same modes let's say and uh, the same uh, of course also in other modes particularly in the mode number eight we see uh, frequency we see vertical structures that are mostly produced at the strong number of 0 3 that is where the kelvin elements instability uh, are produced but we also see other structures that are um, most probably paired with lower frequency content uh, as the uh, the Kelvin Helmut's uh, vortices uh, flow downstream, reduce velocity and so reduce the frequency. But again, this is um, pure speculation because from, from this mode itself we cannot see uh, what, what I'm describing here. And again here we see large structures that are mostly produced at this frequency but the spectra is uh, again taking uh, other scales also. Here in particular you have this low scale that is uh, animating a bit this wall jet that has nothing to do with these structures here. So if we now look at the MPUD modes that are more constrained, we can see now that you have a mode that uh, is reflecting almost, uh, I mean exclusively the large scale structure. So it is only capturing the wall jet uh, large uh, low frequencies. Uh, we have modes that are only capturing the the, the, the the Kelvin elements instability downstream the jet, so in the intermediate range, let's say, and then we have modes that are exclusively uh, combined, I mean coupled to uh, the Kelvin elements instability at the beginning of the jet. So we can see that these structures are mostly at this higher uh, frequency, and as they evolve downstream, their spectra evolves towards a uh, low uh, portion to, towards lower strewal numbers. Now, at this stage, uh, if we were in class, you, you should ask why don't we just take a purely harmonic decomposition to identify uh, these structures? And my answer would be just do it yourself. Uh, in Take the modulo package and do the same exercise using the DFT and you will see that you will not be able to see these structures, let's say, so well simply because they are not characterized by one uh, specific frequency but they are uh, they need more than one frequency and so they will their energy will be distributed into more than one dft mode so i strongly recommend you to do this exercise and then feel free to contact me if you have uh, questions or if you want to discuss this uh, particular e exercise I here show you the convergence of uh, different decomposition for this test case uh, as a function of number of modes included. So here in blue you have uh, the MPOD with one scale, which basically means POD. Here you have the MPOD with three scale, with 50 scales or 2700 scales. This is basically the DFT. And this is the convergence uh, of the DMD using the companion formulation. So this is taken from the uh, original paper uh, that I've cited before where we presented the MPOD. And you can see, uh, as we expected, that uh, the convergence of the MPOD can be uh, arbitrarily close to the POD or, or, the, or the DFT, depending on the number of scales that uh, you're looking for. So to conclude, we can say that uh, with the MPOD we reach a convergence that can be that is comparable to the POD. So we have 
uh, not the optimal energy convergence, but we can keep it really good. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, more degrees of freedom in our analysis. We are now free to choose if you want to have more time localization or uh, frequency localization and this lets us uh, solve the problem the mixing phenomena problems that we have seen for the POD which is uh, in a way coursed by the optimality so it's affected by the course of optimality uh, and in the last step we uh, we can say that uh, the the frequency content of each uh, MPOD mode can be very well bounded by different scales as uh, defined uh, during the multi-resolution step so uh, at the moment you define your kernels you are also defining the frequency content of the structures that you want to see within within each scale with this i thank you very much for uh, your attention i hope that you have enjoyed uh, this mini course uh, with uh, three videos um, I think that with this I have covered uh, all the theoretical background that you need to use uh, our software uh, wisely. The remaining set of tutorials is given by Davide Nini. He was my student during a short training program at the Von Kerman Institute and he is now continuing his studies as a PhD student at the Politecnico di Bari. If you are interested in our programs and possibly joining us in this or in many other projects, please visit uh, this link. The Von Karman Institute offers both a short training period for master thesis or internship and an advanced master after master in fluid dynamics. So Davide was the main developer of the graphical user interface of the software and he will guide you through the installation and several exercises to make sure you can put into practice everything you have learned in this first part of the course. So I hope that you enjoy also the second part and goodbye.